Okay, so I was asked to do a broad overview of geology, climate, and biology. And uh, I just found out I had 25 minutes. <laughs> we'll see how that works. Uh, <coughs> the points I wanted to uh, talk about would include uh, the carbon cycle over these timescales, so you have some sense of what drives uh, CO2 change and climate change, what that climate change looks like over the last you know, 55 million years, and what uh, climate sensitivity appears to be over the, the, the long-term uh, climate record, which is uh, distinct from what most uh, people think about when you think about climate sensitivity in the next, let's say, 50 years, 100 years. So, you know this record very well, perhaps. I, if you don't, you know, we're starting off on the wrong foot. These are measurements of CO2 for the last whatever, 50, 60 years now. And uh, embedded in there is uh, both short term and uh, carbon cycle forcing and, uh, and anthropogenic forcing. So the long term record, of course, is. is uh, being driven by anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, we suspect that change will drive temperature change into the future. This is a very nice paper that explores uh, <coughs> how bad summers might be in the future. You can look where you live. It's not so bad where I live. It's pretty bad. Uh, in the next 100 years or so, this is a record of the probability of, of uh, uh, your summer's being like the worst week of summer today. So if you think about how miserable that week might be, that's your average summer in about 100 years. And where I live, it's about 100% probability that's what it's going to look like. But that, that estimate, and then this is an integrated model estimate, is based on, on uh, uh, of course, <coughs> estimates of CO2 rise. And there's a variety of, of estimates depending on our behavior. And uh, I do want to point out, just point out some of the numbers there. You see the upper limit, which is the business as usual, goes up to about 1,000 ppm. And there's also uh, you know, lower estimates, depending on how hopeful you are. Uh, but it also, these sort of exercises depend on uh, uh, yeah, what is termed climate sensitivity, which is something that, which is inherent to climate models themselves. And that, uh, that is... Uh, essentially a, a, a measure of how t uh, global temperatures will change for CO2 forcing, and in this case it's a doubling of CO2 is what I would think of it, because the doubling of CO2, in the, at least within the range that we're thinking about, uh, uh, produces the same sort of temperature change, right? So you, if you go from 10 to 20 ppm, it'd be about the same as you move from 1,000 to 2,000 ppm. Uh, so climate sensitivity, it, it's a, that's a property of coupled climate models, uh, and equilibrium climate sensitivity is what most people are talking about when they, when they speak about these things. These are cases that were considered originally by this, uh, by Jewel, uh, uh, Jewel Tarney, and uh, that's in 1979 where he was looking at a variety of different models and he was comparing the climate sensitivity of models in relationship to various factors which increase and are enhanced the climate sensitivity, which are known as fast feedback processes, which would include that if I put CO2 into the atmosphere, then it warms the planet just a little bit, but then there's an increase in water vapor, and that's a greenhouse gas, and that enhances warming, and that changes cloud dynamics, which are really poorly constrained in models, and that might uh, uh, warm the planet a bit. All right, and the average equilibrium value is about 3 degrees plus or minus 1.5, and that was 1979, and this is the latest IPCC report, or this is the last one, and it constrains climate sensitivity, equilibrium climate sensitivity within the same range. So that estimate of about 3 degrees plus or minus 1.5 is fairly robust in our modern models. And it's moving up, actually, in the latest models because of, I believe, uh, of... Uh, improvements or at least new cloud type algorithms. <laughs> but when I talk about, uh, when we think about ancient climates, really we're not dealing with equilibrium climate sensitivity. We're, 
we're, or I should say we are dealing with equilibrium climate sensitivity. We're dealing with real equilibrium climate sensitivity, and that is these are, uh, uh, we're allowing the natural system to evolve and to equilibrate over now hundreds of thousands to millions of years. And that would uh, force and include not only fast feedbacks, but a slower feedback. So it would be the full range of feedbacks, some of which are known and some of which are not known. So when I look at the climate sensitivity of the Earth over long time scales, it's a natural experiment. And it's, it's a curiosity to, to think about uh, how that might compare uh, over long time scales versus uh, to, to, uh, to climate sensitivities <coughs> over short term time scales, like decadal or centennial time scales. So here's a range of the type of feedbacks I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. Uh, most models are, are deal with what these, this upper left hand corner and uh, anything in, in a geologic context is, uh, has to include these other factors, vegetation changes, land ice, and this sort of thing. All right, so uh, what, are the, what controls the carbon cycle? Well, what is the carbon cycle over long time scales? Over short time scales, these bumps and wiggles, that's all controlled by things that uh, are, are close and near and dear to you, uh, like like something like that, like trees and grass and land, right? This is something we understand. Uh, there's a relationship between uh, the biosphere and uh, carbon fluxes. And they're massive. These are massive carbon fluxes, right? 120 petagrams per year being pumped in and out of the biosphere. Mostly uh, a signal that's controlling the CO2 record uh, that, you're, that you're familiar with is mostly northern hemisphere. Uh, uh, production and respiration. But there's 120 petagrams pumping in and out. It, you know, anthropogenic uh, it, emissions are about, you know, somewhere, they're like, you know, last time I looked, they're about nine petagrams per year, which is massive. And I'll show you that in a sense. But still, what's going in and out of the, of the system is, is very large. But it's in relative uh, steady state. And uh, so you have the land biosphere, you have the ocean biosphere, and, and uh, it's a little offset because of anthropogenic <coughs> CO2, because there's a net influx of CO2 into the ocean. But uh, if, if CO2 wasn't changing, these, this signal would be balanced as well. And uh, it includes biology as well. Uh, the input of CO2 into, uh, and the distribution of dissolved inorganic carbon, the production of organic matter, and its export productivity to deeper waters, and uh, that mostly is remineralized and, uh, and pumped back out. But there is leakage into the, into the sediments, and of course this, this leakage is, is uh, what's helping to destroy the world today. And uh, in terms of that, that is the org that's the source that we're using, of course, to, to, to energize the, the world. And this leakage here is very important over the long time scales, which I'll discuss in a second. But this is, what, this is just short. Uh, this is a short uh, carbon cycle, and much of that, or variability on that, uh, of that, those processes are responsible for uh, the dynamic change in climate over the last million years. These are the glacial to glacial cycles. So these, these are records from ice cores uh, recording or estimating temperature changes on Antarctica and its relationship to global CO2 changes. And those global CO2 changes are being driven by uh, the perturbations in the biosphere, mostly. I mean, there's, there's also some long-term storage and release going on, but uh, because of how rapid these are, it's clear that the, the biosphere has to be in play. When we step back and, and move into a uh, deeper time, so now this is, uh, this is an isotopic record of, from benthic carbonates, but you can think of it as a temperature record with warmer <coughs> temperatures headed uh, up. And this is millions of years now, right? So now this is the last 65 million years of, of uh, climate, global climate, but mostly driven, the signal really derives from the high latitudes, but you can think of it as the globe, okay? And at this point here, we're in an ice-free world. And most of the Earth is ice-free in terms of its history. So we're actually living in an unusual time. So what controls a long-term carbon cycle, and, imp and <coughs> I'll show you, impacts this, this record, is, uh, is a little, it's a little bit more simple than the short-term record, uh, or the short-term processes. 
first and foremost, it's an uh, influx of CO2 from volcanic and decarbonation uh, sources. So it's plate tectonics, mountain uplift. All right. That inputs CO2. And uh, once mountains are uplifted, uh, you can weather organic <coughs> carbon. And that's what we're doing now, of course, but we're doing it at a much faster rate. So the release of organic material from these uh, fresh sources are also a source of carbon, but it's a, it's a, it's a smaller signal. The most important signal is this volcanic decassing. And uh, the removal of CO2 over these time scales is the weathering of rocks. That's the most important signal. So moving from, or I should say, the weathering of silicate minerals, it's more specific. The, the, to weather a rock, you need two moles of CO2 on average, and it produces two moles of bicarbonate. So you're moving from silicate, granites, and this sort of thing to clays. And that process involves CO2, and it's the transport of CO2 into the ocean that's really critical, because when you move CO2, this bicarbonate and calcium that you've weathered from rocks into the ocean, which is already saturated with respect to calcium carbonate, you produce a mineral. And when you produce that mineral, that calcium carbonate mineral, and it's really biogenic minerals that we're talking about, though you can have this process occur inorganically. When you produce this mineral, it's removed from the system, right? And that's the carbonates, and those are your reefs, and those are the those are your, your sand, beat your carbonate sands that you're pushing your feet into in the tropics, right? And uh, it's on average, it's about a 0.2 petagram per year deposit of this material. In steady state, if nothing was changing, this is the estimate for the influx of CO2 into the atmosphere and the output of CO2 by this process, 0.2 petagrams. We put in nine petagrams every year now. So it's about 50 times the level of the natural background level of CO2 change, right, in and out of the system. We're putting in 50 times a year more than, than the globe does. And, uh, and all of geologic history, when we look at climate change and we look at that record, that's all about some percent change of about 0.2 petagrams per year. That's it. The worst <coughs> scenarios, aside from, let's say, a meteorite impact, which, you know, it's, that's bad. <laughs> but the worst scenarios in terms of our climate record are like maybe, oh, three times as much, you know, so 0.6 <coughs> per year. And those look like big stories in the geologic record. Uh, the subcycle in this, of course, is, uh, like I said before, is, is also this removal of organic material. But it's, it's really the inorganic process of, of chemical weathering and carbonate production and burial that drives long-term CO2 cycle over geologic time. Now, what drives silicate weathering are things that might be obvious to you, but they're, uh, they tend to be argued you know, in, our, in circles. This one. Okay. <clears throat> Temperature, which is just uh, related to reaction rates, water, how fresh that the surfaces are, and the rock type that drives uh, weathering rates. And there are models that uh, that fold in these ideas. Uh, this is what this is: the rate of weathering, and this is erosion, and that's water, and that's temperature. And so these ideas have, are out there, and they're and uh, I think the best ones integrate all of them. But one of the Actually, um, what one very important aspect, which uh, is often overlooked, is uh, the biology. Biology increases weathering rates two to ten times over uh, inorganic rates, right? And weathering rates are really important in driving geologic expressions of, of climate. And so vascular plants, the evolution of vascular plants, root respiration, and most importantly, this uh, mycorrhizal fungi uh, uh, symbiotic relationships with roots are very important in, in the history of climate and something that is actually uh, uh, becoming increasingly explored. The most famous carbon cycle model out there, Bob Berner's work, uh, this is now, time is moving from left to right. This is a, a model, an estimate of CO2 uh, using fairly complex 
carbon cycle model. Uh, most people think it's all about tectonics and uh, seafloor spreading, but uh, as he would say, it's all about <coughs> plants, actually. It's the evolution of plants and, the, and, the, and, the, and how plants react to temperature and water that up drives this model. <coughs> so the biggest drop in, in over the last 600 million years in terms of CO2 and climate is driven by the evolution of higher plants and their effect on weathering rates of rock. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what climate looks like over the last 65 million years. So just to make sure, if, you know, if you're not familiar with this kind of figure, uh, so orient yourself again, that's millions of years, right? 65, 70 million years. Think of this as temperature that's warmer in this direction here. And this is an ice-free temperature of the deep ocean. And this is ice-free from here to here for the most part. So the deep ocean is about uh, minus two, to, excuse me, two to four degrees C today. And uh, for example, peak warming here 50 million years ago, it's up towards, towards 15 degrees C. That means their high latitude winter temperatures are 15 degrees C. The sun is a little cooler because the evolution of stars, inc the temperature increases with time. So it's actually, the sun is a little bit cooler, so we don't have a lot of levers to explain these sort of, this sort of uh, uh, behavior and, and uh, uh, record, right? It's not the sun, and the size of the Earth didn't change because that can impact the temperature of the Earth or any planet. And you're left with either albedo changes, which can drive uh, important changes, or greenhouse gases. But for the most part, uh, this kind of greenhouse uh, climate here is, uh, shows some interesting behavior that's worth talking about. One is this, this, <coughs> this maximum that I was just referring to. Another one is this, uh, these, these uh, bursts of, of temperature increases, in which we're now calling hyperthermals. And here is the onset of Antarctic glaciation 34 million years ago. So after this point, we have ice on the planet. And uh, northern hemisphere ice Greenland doesn't form to about here. Okay, so this is all northern hemisphere is free of ice for the most part, but there's as much ice on Antarctica uh, as today, as soon as it's put on. But the peak warming there, which is mean peak warming here, all right, uh, the the world is a different place. This is a this is what the North Pole looked like 50 million years ago. Uh, there's uh, Meta Sequoia and uh, Cyprus, and there's evidence for palm in the, in the Arctic Ocean. And of course, we know that there are these kind of critters up there as well. And all of this implies a very warm place and a nice free place. In fact, you know, uh, far, far more than just ice free, it's very warm, even though it's dark six months out of the year. These hyperthermals are interesting as well. These are, uh, this is, uh, think of a world that's much warmer than today, about five degrees C warmer than today. That's something that we would, uh, that's not something we, we would enjoy necessarily. Certainly not where I live, because those estimates make it, it suggests it would be in, uh, not be uh, habitable for placental mammals, actually, because of the wet bulb humidity and temperatures would be so high that we wouldn't be able to sweat and pump heat. Right? In fact, the evolution of mammals appears to be a high latitude phenomenon, and, it be, and there it's, it's expressed in uh, the, this, the evolution in, of modern uh, uh, primates and mammals are moving from the early Cenozoic towards today, and they're evolving really in high latitudes where at least they're getting a break, because the low latitudes probably were too warm. So these hyperthermals are expressed as uh, warming on top of the warming, right? Yeah, so it's about five degrees warmer, and then it becomes five degrees warmer, okay? And they happen sort of at regular beats, and they're orbitally, they're, they're, they're impacted by orbital configurations. And so explaining these have been sort of a, a difficult thing to do, but we have some ideas. First of all, it's pretty clear that they're driven by CO2 change because these events, are associated with ocean acidification where the carbonates disappear. Goes to zero, and then they come back. This is about a 200,000 year period, which is about the residence time of CO2, just in case you're not, you don't understand the, his, the, the uh, uh, 
the average time CO2 stays in the atmosphere is, it, it is on the order of tens of thousands of years, not hundreds of years. You know, every CO2 molecule you put into the atmosphere has to be actively removed, or if you would like the nature to do it, it would take about 400,000 years to get to, re to remove the anthropogenic signal. So the way I think of it is that every mole of CO2, you can think of it as like a pound you know, sign floating into the, or a dollar, floating into the, into the atmosphere. And in order to remove it, really, it requires money to pull that back out. This signature of ocean acidification during this period of warming <coughs> is associated with a signal of carbon isotope change. This is a stable carbon isotopic signature, which implies that the carbon uh, cycle is perturbed. Uh, today's rise in CO2 due to anthropogenic forcing is associated with the decrease in the carbon isotopic composition of CO2. Okay? It's a negative change. And the reason why is because the signature, carbon isotopic signature of things varies. The ocean has a signature of about zero, and the atmosphere is a little bit more negative. But petroleum, coal, C3 plants, they're all very negative. So when you it put this into the, if you burn this and put it into the ocean or the atmosphere, you drive the signature more negative. So that's the cl a clear signal from ice cores that we see the uh, carbon isotopic signature of CO2 in ice cores become increasingly negative as soon as the Industrial Revolution hits. Right? <coughs> and so when you see this sort of thing in the geologic record, it's the same idea. All right? I mean, we can explain it in various ways, but the simplest way is, is that there's an input of light carbon so this thing that happens 55 million years ago that helps warm the planet by five degrees is potentially driven by the release of methane hydrates or <coughs> melting of permafrost and the oxidation of organic carbon in high latitudes. So we're reached tipping points at this, at, at, at this time where we have a <coughs> catastrophic release of perhaps methane hydrates, but I prefer the idea of permafrost, which uh, melts and then releases organic carbon, okay? All you need is, for the giving the amount of t uh, time that these things occur, you need about one point, well, well let's say one petagram per year, uh, one petagram per year release of permafrost carbon in order to drive the hyperthermals 55 million years ago. And that's what's happening today. About a petagram per year loss due to permafrost melting. Okay, so is CO2 driving it? Well. It's pretty clear that for the hyperthermal, CO2 is driving those effects, right? But what about the long-term record? We have the capacity to assess that, and CO2 proxies show that clearly that there's a rise in CO2 during peak warming in the last 50 million years ago. Okay. We can compare this to the record itself, and yes, these proxies don't always agree, this is, a, this is based on uh, leaf stomata indices, so it's the number of stoma which are related to CO2 concentrations. I have a particular problem with that because the, sto uh, the experiments on leaf stoma flatten out at around 500 or so ppm, so signals that are above that are hard to detect. Um, but the other records show this clear rise towards CO2, higher CO2 during peak warming. Okay. And using temperature and uh, CO2 records, one can get at some estimates of climate sensitivity over these timescales. So for example, you can play games like this. If the estimates of uh, global temperatures are 9 to 16 degrees warmer than today, and you have some estimate of CO2, you can estimate climate sensitivity, or you can take Charney type of climate sensitivity and estimate what the, the uh, CO2 values should be. And for example, <coughs> if it's, if climate sensitivity is three degrees per CO2 doubling, and we just simply double CO2 to get to these values, all right, you're at the 2200 ppm for a three degrees CO2 doubling. That's within the constraint of our, our data. If it's 60 de six degrees per doubling, it's about 800 ppm, and it would, well, that's a very high climate sensitivity, but the data would also support it. The data doesn't support 1.5 degrees per CO2 doubling. So just a, a simple exercise like this argues that climate sensitivity is certainly above 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.
but perhaps somewhere between three degrees and six. But it's kind of a sloppy way to do it. We can also look at the hyperthermals and argue, or just try to think about what might be driving, uh, well, uh, what the climate sensitivity might be, if, given that we understand that CO2 is driving the signature. And uh, if you take this record here, this carbon isotope record, and think of it in terms of a source of carbon, then you can build a, a complicated figure like this. This curve is a carbon isotope excursion, okay? That's a value for a carbon isotope excursion. And here is the, the isotopic signature of carbon that might be driving that excursion, right? So, for example, if methane is driving it, a minus 60 per mil signature, all right, and if we assume that the value of the excursion is 4 per mil, then that implies a certain amount of CO2 that's inputted and a climate sensitivity given an assumption of background values. And you can do the same thing for, let's say, permafrost type scenario which would be up here, right? CO2 emissions, quite high, and a climate sensitivity. And just on that basis alone, you can constrain some minimum and maximum estimates of climate sensitivity somewhere between three to seven <coughs> degrees, depending on what's the source of carbon. But it's not 1.5 or two degrees. Climate sensitivity in the long haul tends to be a little bit higher than what we see in the short-term effects like the short-term climate uh, equilibrium estimates. Uh, all right, so let me just say a few more words before I stop. If we take a look at some other critical times, for example, this time right here, where ice is forming on Antarctica. So here we're in a greenhouse world without ice. And here we can place almost all the ice on Antarctica all at once, within about 80,000 years. And we look at CO2 records during that time, it's pretty clear that CO2 is involved. There's about a 40% drop in CO2 right at that boundary. Okay? And if you take a close look at that, it follows that boundary, that temperature change quite nicely. Here's the isotopes, or you can think of this as ice volume and temperature, doing this, right? And here are the CO2 estimates. And they track that, that change very well. So a 40% drop in CO2 is associated with about a three to four degree uh, cooling, which leads to about a 4 to 5.5 degree uh, climate sensitivity per CO2 level, which is now quite a bit higher than your equilibrium estimates and also higher than what we're finding for uh, minimum estimates in a greenhouse world. And what drives that drop in CO2? I don't know. It's anybody's guess, but it's one of the things I just was talking about. It has to do with either weathering or changes in the flux of CO2 into the system. In fact, all you need is a 20%, or this is a 25% offset between weathering and, uh, and, uh, and CO2 flux. If you had started with 2,000 ppm in, in, less, in about 2 million years, you'll go from 2,000 to zero, okay? A 25% offset between in and out, right? So changes in weathering rate will drive CO2 from 2,000 to zero in two million years. That's 20% of 0.2 petagrams per year. If I shut off all of weathering right now, I double CO2 in a half million years. You know, see? So it, we're talking about small numbers when we think about the geologic record. Everybody says, well, this is very difficult, very you know. But the fact is that these are small numbers and we're just percents of small numbers. But the system is really tightly balanced and tuned. It's remarkable that there's not so much change in the world, right, in terms of the history of the Earth. We don't see climate flying off the, you know, the charts and coming back down. It's like steady change for tens and tens of millions of years. That means the system is locked in with in, in regard to feedback very nicely. You're probably going to kick me off soon, right? Yeah. Okay. You're, you're, you're not threatening me. Yeah, well, you're supposed to I don't play me. that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so. What drives, what drives this, and when we, when we think about the, the long-term record and what, what are the factors that are controlling that expression of, of temperature and climate, 
I, you know, I, I, you know for the first stop is just to think about mountain uplifts, right? So, you know, why did this drop occur right at that, that boundary? I don't know, but it probably had to do with uh, uplift, because there's a lot of uplift going on during this time. There's uplift in, in the Himalayas, and, and it's even more active afterwards. There's uplift in, uh, in the, uh, the Cordilleran uh, and the Laramide orogeny, so it's in, in North America and South America, these, these mountains, and uh, there's uplift in um, uh, New Zealand and New Guinea and, and, uh, and, and massive erosion. So all this is, it acts as downward pressure on the carbon cycle to remove CO2 because there's fresh rock to be weathered and that material is weathered and brought into the ocean and we're removing carbon. But what's interesting about this behavior uh, is that after about 20 million years, CO2 is flat. It doesn't seem to go very much lower, which is interesting because there's, what should stop the world from falling into an ice house world? If you remove CO2, it's over, you know? Uh, and, it, and in many ways, that has happened in the past. We have you know, this idea of snowball earth, you've heard of this, or slush ball earth, whatever you want to call it now. But there's, what stops CO2 from being removed completely? Well, it's just luck, partly. But for the last 25 million years, sorry, it's been really tightly balanced. And, and I, you have to ask, well, I, have, I, have, yeah, I would ask why. And the reason, at least why I think this is so flat here, is because this reflects a biological control on the minimum estimate of CO2 as long as biology has any say in it. You know? So biology, or land plants, increase weathering rates two to ten times over inorganic rates, right? If I compromise that, I slow down weathering rates, I slow down the drawdown of CO2. So what would drive, what would slow down uh, biological activity would be, of course, CO2 limitation on land plants. Now, you can take an ecosystem and choke it off with CO2, and you can see the net effect, right? And this is something that you know, I don't need to go into great detail with, I'm sure, the group here. Uh, the, the effects of photorespiration on C3 plants are, are critical in the efficacy of photosynthesis. <laughs> so during C3 path, in the C3 path, pathway, Rubisco is king, right? Ribulose, bisphosphate, carboxylase, oxygenase. The oxygenase part of this enzyme reacts with oxygen, and if it does that, it uh, causes photorespirations, which reduces the overall photosynthetic efficiency. And so if CO2 falls too low, photorespiration rates are too high, plants don't behave well. And this expression here, of low CO2 with minimum change may very well mean that we are at the compensation point for the global ecosystem for a given temperature. If temperature falls a little bit, then we can drop CO2 down a little bit more because photorespiration rates are, are associated with a particular temperature. So that's one thought that biosphere is helping to prevent a, a minimum estimate over the long haul. And the other thing I just want to say before you kick me off is that <laughs> this low CO2 range here and the invariant nature, the apparent invariant nature, speaks to climate sensitivity because if CO2 is driving climate over the last 25 million years and there's quite a bit of climate going on, then it implies a very high climate sensitivity and uh, over the geologic time scales. And for example, we can look at the last 5 million years, this period of time right here, so we're right from here over, right, where we have, we move from uh, what we call the warm early Pliocene, where temperatures are about <coughs> three to four degrees warmer than today, right, and from there we fall into northern hemisphere glaciation and ice ages, and when we look at CO2 estimates for five million years ago, or four or five million years ago, our maximum estimates for CO2 <coughs> are very much like today. 400 ppm, maybe a little bit more. That's max. And if you estimate global temperatures during that time with our, our estimates for CO2, then climate sensitivity is up to about 6 degrees, <coughs> 7 degrees per CO2 doubling uh, over long time scales when you allow the global system to equilibrate. 
So my last slide looks like this, where if this is the IPCC estimate for equilibrium climate sensitivity, the estimates for uh, climate sensitivity over Earth history are higher, with estimates about three and a half degrees per CO2 doubling 55 million years ago. When we put ice on the planet, it increases as well because that changes the climate state and introduces another set of feedbacks. And then by the time we're close to what we look like today, we're up to somewhere around six to seven degrees per CO2 doubling. 